To all of you watching, welcome to World Have Your Say, live from our new home, the World's Newsroom. And of course, over the next hour, we'll keep you abreast of all of the developments with the Algerian hostage situation. We're also, though, going to talk about militant Islam in West and North Africa and how best to combat it. To help us, we've got guests live from the south of England, also one from London, and we'll be joined by people in Paris and from Mali as well. Now, wherever you're watching, and in particular, if you're watching in Mali, or Algeria, you're very welcome to take part. All the usual contact details apply. We're on the phone, you can tweet us, get us on Facebook, or get us on Skype. We're live, and the more of you who get in touch, the more of you we'll put on the air. Well, it's good to have your company today. If you do tweet us or Facebook or email us, all of those comments come straight to me here in the studio and I'll weave your thoughts into our conversation as best we can. And probably the biggest talking point of the last 24 hours has been whether the Algerian military were too fast to go into that gas installation in the Sahara to deal with the hostage situation. Let's immediately bring in Smaid Belkade, who's an Algerian who lives in London. Smaid, do you feel your government was too hasty? No, it wasn't, too, it wasn't too hasty. The government took, uh, was in a, a dilemma and there were, there were two offers from the ground. Either the, um, the, the gas field would be blown out uh, up with all its content or the uh, army should move quickly and rescue as much uh, hostages, hostages as they could. And thus the second offer was, 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 was there and they moved in rapidly. And we are seeing now so many hostages have been, have been rescued. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, within that, uh, during that intervention, some un unlucky ones were, 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 were killed. Uh, that, that's what happened. It's, uh, it's, uh, it was a matter of death uh, or mm -hmm. life uh, for which the government uh, took the right action. The, the, the Algerian ar army took the right action. And what you're saying is echoed by the Algerian Prime Minister. He's come out and said he thought that he had information to suggest that the hostage takers wanted to escape and that was why he took action. He feared for the health of the hostages. Now let's bring in my colleague Mohanad from BBC Monitoring. And BBC Monitoring, Mohanad, is all about monitoring foreign media so we can understand what's being said. And foreign media is helping us understand this hostage situation. Tell us the latest information you have from BBC Monitoring. Well, within the sources that we have been looking at, which are primarily Algerian and Mauritanian sources, uh, at the moment the picture is uh, s some 650 hostages have been released. Uh, the 573 of them uh, are Algerians and the rest are foreigners. And uh, uh, up to 55 foreign nationals are still unaccounted for. And do you believe that the primary sources you're relying on are reliable? Well, to a large extent, we've been, uh, with regards to the situation in uh, southern Algeria and northern Mali, we have been following uh, uh, various sources in Mauritania, in Algeria, and they have been largely reliable. I mean, especially Mauritanian sources have been very l reliable in uh, painting a picture on what is happening in northern Mali since mm -hmm. the uh, Azawad region was, was announced as an autonomous region. Uh, a few months ago in 2011, around April. So since then, militant, militant groups and groups in control of Northern Mali have been in contact with uh, a couple of news agencies, privately owned Mauritanian news agencies, and uh, as far as that, uh, most of our sources have been reliable. Mahan, thank you very much indeed. And if you're watching and want to comment on the Algerian action both today and primarily yesterday, I suppose, the hashtag we're using is WHYS. You can also get us at facebook.com slash world have your say. Uh, all your messages come to me, but we can also pull them up on the screen here behind me. Stanislaus in uh, southern Africa has got in touch, Zambia to be precise. I'd like to ask your guests how they would have liked the Algerians to handle this. Well, let's put that to uh, Snaid, who we've already so spoken to, but also William Jordan's joining us live from Paris, a former senior US diplomat in Algeria. Sir, thank you for your time today. Do you think the Algerians got it right? Whether the Algerians got it right or wrong, uh, I think the Algerians acted as uh, I would have expected them to. Uh, as uh, the first uh, caller indicated, uh, Algeria 
brooks no uh, opposition or uh, takes no short measures as far as dealing with terrorism. I mean, this is a very serious problem. Obviously, uh, a lot of the details haven't yet come in on the degree to which Algerian officials were in full coordination with uh, the U.S., Britain, France, and the other countries who had hostages. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not going to second guess the Algerians at this point. Uh, I think that what they've done is fully consistent mm -hmm. with the determined and resolved way in which they handle these kind of situations. But, Smain, lots of people have been pointing out your government prefers uh, take no prisoners approach. Is that always the best way of tackling Islamist militants if they attack in this way? They, the, the policy they have with regard to dealing with the, uh, uh, the security matters is no negotiation, uh, no concession, and no blackmailing. And uh, no, uh, uh, another aspect is no publicity. That's the, that's the approach they have always taken since 1995, and that remains the policy uh, 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 against uh, any group of mm -hmm. terrorists. Smain, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's uh, just uh, pull up another message here to look at from Robin in Kentucky in the States, posting on facebook.com slash worldhaveyoursay. I would like to know why they were so quick to do the raid. What changed? And Well, William, we're still waiting for a lot of information, but the indications from the government are they believed the situation was unravelling, that they needed to intervene. Absolutely. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, there was a decision made by the Algerian commander on the scene uh, in uh, Ain Aminas and communicated that quickly up the chain of command, uh, probably to reaching President Bouteflika himself. And uh, once he got what he needed, which was a green light to go ahead with an operation, he launched it. Um, I, I doubt there was any time to uh, do a whip around of anybody uh, to either uh, ask whether uh, other countries were agreeable to that or whether uh, other countries would have, would have uh, preferred to wait uh, a while longer. Um, I, I think uh, as soon as the message came down from the Algerian president, go, the Algerians went. And you'll notice as you're watching that lots of you aren't just setting in uh, views, you're also sending in questions for our guests, and you're very welcome to keep those coming in. Well, have you say at bbc.com if email is your preferred way of getting in touch. And Mohanad at uh, BBC Monitoring, let me just put a query to you that lots of our viewers are raising. Why is it there's such confusion over the number of people who were taken hostage and also the number who have managed to escape? Well, I think the confusion is primarily because the Algerian government, on, on, on one hand, has been... Uh, issuing statements uh, at, at relatively lengthy intervals and at each statement they were giving an update according to the numbers that they have. Uh, meanwhile, the, ter uh, the, the militant group that held the hostages have been releasing uh, their own figures. At one incident yesterday they were reporting that 35 uh, hostages have been killed. Then later on they contacted the, the media again and said that uh, they had seven hostages which were still alive. And the, the, relatively, the, the, the militants' media campaign has, sec has succeeded in creating uh, this uh, sense of confusion, in a way. But to go back to your previous speaker, uh, Algerian commentators have noted, uh, uh, so or uh, security sources have reported to the Algerian media, that the commander on the ground had been in negotiation with the hostage takers from Wednesday on through to some time uh, on Thursday morning when he had clear information that the hostages were going to escape the Ain Aminas complex and head towards Mali and that they have uh, essentially booby-trapped parts of the complex. And in that context, that's why the reaction from the Algerians was quite swift. And Mohanad, I just want to pick up on this with, with William in Paris because it's widely reported that the man who is behind this attack, Mokhtar Bal Mokhtar, who leads the Battalion of Blood, he, he split from Al-Qaeda recently, that he's made millions of dollars from taking hostages and getting ransoms. So clearly he is used to people being prepared to talk to him. Yes and no. I mean, I think that... Uh, uh, He's prepared to do whatever he needs to do in order to further his, uh, his own standing uh, within Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, as well as uh, the activity of his organization. Uh, certainly, he has carried out uh, um, kidnapping operations and held people for ransom and made some money from that. But I've always believed that uh, we probably overestimate in the West the degree to which that money 
is enough to fund all of the activities uh, for uh, AQIM in the region. And a lot of what uh, Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar uh, depends on has to do with local trafficking and tolls that he gets for smuggling and other uh, criminal type activities. The one point that I would say about this is that I think that as far as Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar is concerned, this operation is critical to solidifying one of the things that he is proudest of, and namely that he is one of the most audacious, most daring AQIM leaders uh, in play uh, in, in northern Mali, and he is prepared and has the means to carry out spectacular operations of this kind. And William, it's worth adding to all of our viewers that when you say AQIM, you're talking about al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, although it is now reported that he is split from al-Qaeda and is very much his own man. Now, a couple of things to mention. Uh, you'll notice that we've got a new home here for World Have Your Say in the world's newsroom, but the principles remain the same. Our program's about putting the experiences and the expertise of all of you right at the heart of the BBC's news coverage. We're already getting people getting in touch from a number of different countries, Uganda, Cambodia, Saudi Arabia, Benin, Cameroon, Ghana and Algeria. And perhaps not surprisingly, lots of you in Western North Africa are wanting to comment on the issue of militant Islam and how to tackle it. Uh, we, have to, uh, we do have one feature, though, which we're wanting to use a lot more than we've done in our previous home. It's called a video uploader. You'll find it at worldhaveyoursay.com. And uh, there you can upload your views using your smartphone or your tablet and we'll use them. Now, now, let me show you the comments of one uh, gentleman who was part of this hostage standoff. He managed to escape. He's been speaking to the media. I stayed hidden for almost 40 hours in my room, under the bed. I put boards everywhere, just in case. I had food, water to sustain myself, and I did not know how long I would stay there. When the soldiers came to get me, I did not even know that it was over. They were with my colleagues, otherwise I would never have opened the door. There's one of the gentlemen who managed to escape the situation in the Sahara in Algeria. By the way, we're not just talking about Algeria, we're also going to look at Mali. I know that some of you in Nigeria want to talk about militant Islam and the impact that's having, particularly in the north of your country. So if you do have views on how the region and the individual government should respond to the threat from Islamists in different parts of North and West Africa. We'd very much like to hear you. All the contact details will be on the screen as we go along. No, I talking about it. Ten points, but let me say something. Hi, I'm Ros Atkins. I want to show you our new video uploader. It's now much easier for you to give us things that you've seen or questions or comments that you have about the day's news. In fact, some of you are using it already. Hi, this is Hans in the woods near Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, I'm Ray in Beijing. Hi, I am Abdel Hidat in Morocco. All you have to do is go to worldhaveyoursay.com. I recorded this on my phone, and once I'd done that, I came to this page at worldhaveyoursay.com, clicked on Upload, selected the file, and that was that. Or you can use a webcam through any computer. Just go to the same page. When you're there, click Record, say what you've got to say, then press stop, scroll down, click submit, and we'll do the rest. So that's the new BBC video uploader. You can get it at worldhaveyoursay.com. I'm interested to see what you send it. People are gonna wanna know. Let's just say something. No, I am talking about it. Ten points, but let me say something. Hi to all of you watching on BBC World News. Welcome back to World and Have Your Say. We're following the hostage situation in Algeria, also talking about the unrest in Mali too, and taking on the broader issue of militant Islam in North and West Africa. Lots of you have been getting in touch. Iyad's watching in Dubai. He says, what's worse than being captured by Islamists, being rescued by the Algerian army? And uh, Ogne says, it would be better if the Algerian authorities let the companies negotiate with the terrorists. Well, I think the government would argue perhaps it's for them to do the negotiating, but also maybe there wasn't time to bring in the numerous different companies who have a stake in this gas field. Now, let's talk about the broader issue across the region. We've already met William Jordan. He was a US uh, diplomat in Algeria. Let's also bring in Alice Ukoku, who works for the Women in Africa group. She's Nigerian, though based in London. And Dr. Bernie Seb is an expert on North Africa from the University of Birmingham. And though he's French, he's lived in this part of North Africa 
before. Um, Dr. Seb, let me perhaps start with you. Um, I've got a number of questions from viewers, all asking similar points, which is, to what extent is this the Mali conflict spilling over into Algeria now? Yeah. Good afternoon. Yes, it is definitely a very closely linked conflict. Uh, and actually, we're talking about the two sides of the same coin, because the conflict started as, first of all, a confrontation between the Islamist militants and the Algerian government in the 1990s in what was called the Dirty War of Algeria, which claimed the lives of between 70,000 and 150,000 people, lasting over 10 years and being a vicious war of peace as well, taking place in several places places of uh, Algeria and also needing a scaling up of the capability of the Algerian army so that it could finally claim victory against most of the terrorist groups operating in the first place in northern Algeria but then afterwards in the Sahara as well mm -hmm. which is the place where they sought refuge once they were no longer able to resist the attacks which the Algerian army launched against their facilities so, and their men. So to a large extent, it's actually an Algerian-born conflict which was mm -hmm. later on exported to Mali and which comes back to Algeria today in, through these uh, terrorist activities. So bearing that in mind, William, are you following this whole story and thinking, well, when I was working in Algeria, I knew this was coming. The world just hadn't woken up to it. Absolutely. In fact, uh, for the last 10 years, when, uh, from back when I was in Washington, I've been following the situation and seeing uh, the situation in northern Mali developing with what was then called the uh, Salafist Group for Preaching and Combat, which later became a QIM, uh, implanting itself and, and really creating a, a presence that was not only uh, destructive to Mali, but also to, uh, to the rest of the world. The most alarming aspect of this, and I agree with everything that Dr. Seb just said, the most uh, aggravating aspect of this over the past year that we've seen, of course, is with the collapse of the Gaddafi regime in Libya and the sudden uh, proliferation of uh, light and uh, sophisticated weaponry, in addition to the return of some of the people who were under uh, uh, Gaddafi's control, um, has aggravated and intensified a lot of the cleavages and conflicts in northern Mali, but you have to look at this as a regional whole, and, and, and regional not just in terms of the Sahel, not just in terms of the Maghreb, but in terms of the Trans-Sahara uh, region of northwest Africa. Mm -hmm. William, thank you very much indeed. We're getting lots of tweets on the WHYS hashtag. Let me just read you a couple. And by the way, if you're watching and you send any messages via email, Facebook or Twitter, it all comes straight to me here and I'll weave as many of your points as I can into the conversation. Sam in Zambia says, why is Algeria taking so much of the blame for this? Mir in India suggests this is the beginning of a new period of time where Americans are being targeted abroad. And Julu in Liberia says the action of Algeria should be supported by all of the nations. Well, at the moment, uh, there are certainly some lukewarm responses to what Algeria has done. Now, it's so quick how all of this has developed. This time last week, we were looking at the beginning of French military involvement in Mali. And all week long, President Francois Hollande has been very keen uh, to emphasize that he feels he still has made the right decision. Let's just look at one quote that he's given in the last day or so. What's happening in Algeria provides further evidence that my decision to intervene in Mali was justified. I just wonder, Alice, whether you agree with that? I do not. I do not agree that uh, military uh, uh, intervention from outside into uh, Mali was the right uh, decision to make. So obviously the French go uh, president has said he will go in to protect uh, the French citizens and also the, the French interest. Mm -hmm. So obviously coming from that uh, point of national interest, uh, that will be fine. But at the same time, it need, for me, I, I, will, I will expect that when uh, in, uh, external uh, intervention is going in, you, you must say precisely why you are going in. Mm -hmm. So if you don't say why you are going in, you'll get people confused. Well, he's saying he's going in to protect the government because the militants in the north were making progress towards Bamako. Dr. Seb, do you think Francois Hollande has made a convincing case for French military intervention? Yes, I have to say that, uh, and this is completely uh, separate from uh, the point of view which I'm uh, developing as a French citizen, I, but uh, I believe that actually the decision was perfectly justified on the grounds that A, it was the Malian government which requested help, and B, also every effort had been made to favour 
a negotiated outcome to the crisis. I mean, we need to bear in mind that northern Mali has been under the rule of the Islamist militant groups since the summer of 2012, mm. and a lot of efforts had been also invested into negotiating, especially in the Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, under the aegis of President Blaise Kampaore, and in particular in liaison with the Algerian the counterparts and Algerian diplomatic efforts were made in order to find a negotiated outcome to the stalemate in Mali. So, Dr. However, Seb, let, let, me, Dr. Really, Seb let, me, let me just jump in, though, because you're, you're giving a lot of reasons to justify the French actions, and as you're doing it, Alice, I can see your brow becoming more and more furrowed. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, what, I, what I, I know is that the world is sleepwalking into a third world war situation. And we appear to be getting quite a lot of justifiable reasons for this to happen at each point of the way. I believe very firmly that civil society is part of the, the should be part of the, the peace seeking process. Mm -hmm. Because when you bring arms to bear in a situation that is so volatile as, as, as in Mali, then obviously the, the grass where all of this will happen should mm -hmm. also be consulted. It is say we are, we, are, we are made to believe that because the president of Mali asks for external interruption, uh, uh, intervention, then that justifies uh, France going in. And Alice, uh, let, me t Alice let me tell you that Sambu Jang in Gambia is is watching you and all of our other guests, and he's really backing up what you're saying. He says, isn't it possible for the French to help uh, suspend military operations and try and find a political solution? I mean, Dr. Seb, wouldn't French efforts be better off speaking to the militants in the north, speaking to the government and seeing if uh, some halfway house can be found? Yes, this is actually what has been going on for months now, and everyone has been putting all the efforts that were possible in order to come to a resolution of the conflict, which was peaceful and negotiated. The issue is that as immediately after the Islamists decided actually to intervene militarily and to break the statu quo, which had been prevailing since the summer, mm -hmm. what was the best solution? Was it just to let the Malian government uh, collapse in Bamako and then see where we could take it from? whilst everyone else had actually agreed to arrange for an international force to come in September. But if by September there was no Malian government anymore, mm -hmm. what was the point of organizing such but a, I suppose there a will be operation? There will be some that was the whole idea. There will be some Syrians thinking, well, hold on a minute. There have been many times when the Syrian opposition has asked for the French to help out militarily and other powers besides, and it hasn't come. So what's the difference? Here, um, lots of you are getting in touch. I'll work in as many of your comments as I can. Uh, recent calls coming in from Nepal, Ethiopia, Gambia, Greece, Canada, and India. But let's go live now to one of the countries that we're talking about, to Mali, Bamako, to be precise. Kumba Ba is an activist there. And Kumba, tell me, are you glad the French have come? Hello, hi to everyone. Of course, I'm very glad that the French uh, came, and I think. Uh, all the French people, the French government, and the president himself. Uh, my sister just said that uh, to her, the French people should have not come. But I think we need to bear in mind, we, we have been watching each other position for the past nine months, to not even say a year, because uh, this whole started, you know, situation started back in January 2012. And as far as we all know, nobody was doing any military action for the nine past months. We were watching each other's position, we were talking, trying to talk, to negotiate, but what do we do when we become attacked? We were attacked, and if French people had not helped us with our aerial strike, we would have been in a very, very dramatic situation. So the French people did just what they were supposed to do. Anybody who wants social justice, who wants to help, and who wants people to get freedom of their religion should be for this war. Because we are not doing, um, how do you say, it's just self-defense. So to me, there is no thinking about that. And Kumbra, I'm just going to it jump in here because we're just coming up to the end of the half hour here on World Have Your Say, but you're very welcome. I can see Alice very keen to respond and Dr. Seb too. All of you, just bear with me. I'll come back to you in a moment. But a passionate justification there by Kumba live from Bamako saying we needed the French to come in to get the differences between the North and the Islamists and the government moving. I wonder if you agree with that. We'll be live here on BBC World News in a couple of minutes time. Let me say something.
Hi, Ros Atkins. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. We're following the hostage situation in Algeria, also the conflict in Mali, and we're having a broader discussion about militant Islam in North and West Africa. Next, we'll be joined live by guests in Nigeria, Mali, and also in the UK. If you'd like to take part, wherever you're watching, the numbers, the Skype contact, the Twitter and Facebook details will all be on the screen as we go along. All of your comments come straight to me here. Julia in London's just tweeted us, my father works in oil and had an option of starting a project in the Maghreb last year. He declined because of safety. And Luis is watching us in New York also on Facebook saying, what are the chances of this situation spilling into other countries? Well, we'll put that point to Dr. Seb from the University of Birmingham and keep those questions and comments coming. I'll work in as many as I can. More and more support coming in for the way Algeria acted, the way it went into the gas facility yesterday to take on uh, those who are holding the hostages. AWOL in Nigeria has just called up saying, Algeria is acting the best way. They shouldn't give militants any chance at all. Well, just before the news, uh, we were speaking to Kumba, live with us from Bamako in Mali. She was saying it's good that the French have come in to break the deadlock between the government and the rebels in the north. And Alice from Women in Africa, a Nigerian living in London, you were clearly not disagreeing. Why don't you think the French can be useful in helping to move this conflict towards a resolution? What I think that is the major problem that the world is facing at the moment is that in Africa in particular, we don't have a middle ground. We don't that have sound doesn't sound too good, uh, Alice. Just hold us there a little while. We'll sort out that microphone. In the meantime, let me bring in Smain, an Algerian living in London. And Smain, uh, more and more support from our viewers coming in for the decisive action or the attempt at decisive action yesterday from your government. I presume that's something you support based on what you said earlier. Absolutely. Uh, that, that was the best, co best course of action to save as much life as, 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 as it could be. And I think they, were, they, they succeeded in that, in that, uh, in that um, uh, area. Smate, thank you very much indeed. Well, Edward's watching us in Freetown and uh, he says, I think the French have plunged too deep to go back. Well, let's put that point to Kumba, who's live with us from Bamako. Do you think the French will be in your country for a long, long time? You know, I don't have any problem with that, and I think most Mali and don't have any problem with that, because um, I think I've said this a few days ago, back in, on the radio, we and French people is not today a relationship. We have been together officially for over, since the 15th century. And the French people who are living here are over 6,000 citizens. And they are not even like expatriates. They live deep in the villages. We get married to each other. Mm -hmm. So most French people know more about my country than I do myself, living here on the ground. So far, the general feeling in Mali is really bad of trust. We, we are towards the French. So if the French need to stay here for five years, six months, three months, you know, I think for the French, for the Malian, we all want this war to be over as soon as possible. That's but, our greatest wish. But the point but is, Kumba, you, you may be speaking. open to the idea of the French staying for a long time. I wonder if the French public is open to that idea. Dr. Seb, you are French, though you're based in the UK. Do you think Francois Hollande would be able to persuade people in France that military action should not be about weeks, it should be about months and even possibly years? Yes, it is true that it might be a rather tough uh, job for the president to justify to public opinion that the operation is taking longer than initially anticipated. But, I mean, if we look at the precedent, for instance, of Afghanistan, we see that public opinion can be ready, actually, to tolerate this type of commitment. And as has just been mentioned also by your correspondent in Bamako, I think that there are also very strong ties between the, the Malian and French populations, and I hope that this would be actually a very good way of ensuring that the French population in general understands the reason of the French commitment to defending the Republic of Mali. Dr. Seb, thank you very much thank indeed. A couple of other points to bring up that you're uh, sending in on a line. Uh, Richard in Texas, thanks for tuning in. He's tweeted us using the WHYS hashtag. He says, expat oil workers have long accepted the places they work are not holiday spots. Well, I guess that's true, but maybe uh, they at least expect not to be taken hostage by Islamist militants. Uh, more comments coming in from Norway, Pakistan, New Zealand 
and Bangladesh. Let's just go back to Smain, the Algerian in London, who's with us live. Smain, do you worry that what we're seeing is a, a problem that could spiral across Libya, across Mali, into Nigeria and other countries in West Africa? Yeah, there are concerns uh, 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 about uh, terrorism in the, in the Sahel, but uh, the terrorism was defeated in Algeria, within the border, uh, uh, and, uh, and it was pushed uh, the, 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 it was pushed uh, towards the Sahel, so they took uh, they took they went to Mali, Niger, Mauritania, uh, and uh, from where we are seeing now, uh, this became a hot a hot uh, uh, area in terms of terrorism. There is yes, indeed, there, there are worries uh, in that sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Well, on the issue of the French involvement in Mali, uh, Frank in the US has just called up to say the French should not intervene. Uh, they'll endanger innocent lives. They should negotiate. Well, I think the French and the Malian government would argue they tried to negotiate and they didn't feel that the rebels were listening. And Annette has just called up to say it's good the Algerians went in on Thursday. The Norwegian government isn't doing anything. And that's a reference to the fact that some Norwegians are caught up in this situation. Uh, she makes reference to the Anders Breivik attack and criticises the Norwegian government government's response to that. Uh, the hashtag, as I keep mentioning, is WHYS. Let's pull this up from Camille in Paris. Uh, she has tweeted us saying, the Putin method, tough but effective in the long term, discourages terrorists. For the families, it's another story. Well, Smain, you've been arguing for tough action against terrorists, but if you get tough with them, there are other people, innocent people, who often suffer. Well, we have to accept the fact that if you want to defeat, defeat the terrorism, the, there is price to be paid. It's not free. And this is what happened in, uh, at, in Amenas uh, um, uh, 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 gas field. So the price had to be paid, I'm afraid to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, some innocent people will have to, uh, will, will, will be killed in the, in the middle of the crossfire. Thank that, you that's, that's, the price, that's the price we have to accept to pay in order to combat this uh, the terrorism. You say it's a price worth paying. I wonder if those of you watching agree with that. Um, Kumbar, just before I let you go from Bamako, I've got to ask you, is your life being affected by the conflict or is life today the same as it was last year or the year before? Oh, no, definitely not. Life has been affected mine personally and all Malians. We have been living this terrible situation for a year, actually, because it started full-fledged on January 17, 2012. But what I would like to say, for the Malian, the general feeling today is that of a relief. Because to us, it is the uh, beginning of the, of the end. Maybe for the international community, it's the beginning. But to Malia, it's the beginning of the end because we have been suffering and we wanted to see some action for the longest. So frankly, this is even though it's full-fledged war, we welcome it because to us it's better than just sitting and crossing our fingers. Well, so the general you. feeling today is out of hope. Thank you very much for joining us live and best wishes to you. Dr. Seb, I wonder if I could just bring you in quickly because lots of our viewers are asking variations on the question what other countries could now be sucked into this? Do you think there are other countries in North or West Africa which could be affected? Yes, it is true that in any case, it is also one of the main objectives of the Islamist militant groups to expand their struggle to neighboring countries. So they started in Algeria, then settled in Mali, but they've got their sights on other countries. And in particular in Mauritania, where they used to be very active until the Mauritanian government waged also a very determined war against them. So I suppose that because it's neighboring with Libya, it is also, with the Mali, sorry, with, because it's neighboring with the Mali, it is also a very clear target. Niger cannot be avoided in particular because it is also an excellent terrestrial link towards Libya where they can possibly get as well some further support coming from areas which are not necessarily under the full control of the government in Tripoli. So I would say that these, especially all these countries from the Sahara Salian area, mm -hmm. Mauritania and Niger, Possibly, but no less surely than in uh, Mauritania, for instance, Chad as well, where some Tubu leaders might be tempted as well to join forces in order to rebel against the central government in Chad. So yes, there is potential beyond Algeria and Mali for the conflict to spread. 
and, and for that reason action also was, re was needed because otherwise there would have been the risk of a very quick spread of the violence beyond the borders of Mali. Dr. Seb, thank you very much. The good news is we've fixed Alice's microphone. And Alice, we're talking a lot about Algeria and Mali, but actually Nigeria has a very serious problem with militant Islam. Do you worry that Boko Haram may get sucked into the broader picture? Of course. I'm extremely worried. But first, I want to make... There are three points I want to make, because I've not been able to come in. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, French intervention in Mali and, of course, my colleague, they're saying that uh, they welcome it because they feel that is the, is the beginning of the end for them. I think it's a little bit uh, 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 untimely to think that this is the best way to go because military intervention uh, is not something that you are, the French comes in, then they are battling the, the, the Islamists, and that, that's it. No, I don't think so, because we, nobody knows yet how this is going to end. And there is no way at all, military mm -hmm. action, a counter-military is going to lead to a peaceful uh, 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 living in Mali. That is for that. So I do not agree that mm -hmm. the French going in without finding a diplomatic, uh, a peaceful method of solving the problem is the best way. Then on coming to Algeria, I would say that the Algerian government actually behaved the way uh, a sovereign nation should behave. I believe that every government should take responsibility for whatever happens in their area of, of, uh, of mm -hmm. governance. So therefore, the, the Algerian government actually, for me, has full mark of saying we are a government, we do not condone this kind of behavior in our, in our territory, in our government. So in you our give country. the Algerian government full marks. I can see full. Smain uh, <laughs> nodding his head. Uh, just hold some further thoughts because we've got a couple of other things we need to bring in, Alice. But I promise I will come back to you. As I mentioned a little bit earlier in the program, we've now got a video uploader. So if you're watching the program and would like to contribute that way, you can uh, record something on your tablet, on your phone or on your PC. And either we'll record it for you or you can record it in advance and upload it. You can do that at worldhaveyoursay.com. It's very, very simple. You'll see all the introductions and the uh, explanations when you get there. worldhaveyoursay.com. Let's have a look at one of the videos that's just come in. My name is Merlin Wilcox. I'm a GP and I've been working in primary health care in Mali on and off since 2004. I left the country on Sunday overland through Burkina Faso. At the present time, there are not great numbers leaving in the south of the country, which is still stable thanks to the rapid intervention of the French. The vast majority of my Muslim friends and colleagues in Mali are very grateful to the French for their rapid intervention. They say that the people leading this war are not real Muslims, and many are not even Malians. They are jihadists, and they want them out of their country as soon as possible. Mali can ill afford to lead this war. At the best of times, one in five children dies before his fifth birthday. Now, even health service vehicles are being commandeered to help in the war effort. Well, Mali, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, Alice, a quick response from you there. Do you accept there are many people in Mali who welcome the French? Well, people will welcome the French uh, coming in because it would appear that the, the, the Malian government is completely mm. helpless. And when you have a situation where government is helpless, then that government is not worth its title. The government, every sovereign government, should be in a position to secure its citizens. Mm. And obviously this has failed. And we also get a bring in Nigeria because we know now that the Nigerians have also brought in arms to come in, to come and defend the Malians in this, in this crisis. Well, you're we quite also, right. There, we there. also know, sorry, we also know that Boko Haram, a lot of the people fighting the war in, the, in Boko Haram where Nigerians are not safe, uh, again, may not be Nigerians per se. And all I was uh, doing, Alice, was just jumping in to your mentioning <laughs> the Nigerian involvement in Mali, and it's probably worth giving uh, those of you watching a couple of figures. 1,200 Nigerian troops are expected to be in Mali in the future. They're not all there now. Chad is planning to send up to 2,000, and several other African countries will also be contributing to the military effort to combat the rebels in the north of the country. Well, Dr. Seb, Alice and Smain, thank you very much indeed. I can see Alice has got a number of other points, but we're going to turn our attention to Lance Armstrong in a little while. So uh, uh, we're going to turn our attention to that. So those uh, of you who want to talk about the situation in North and West Africa, I would just say head to our Facebook page and we will get back to you on that, uh, either through our radio programme or we may, be, may well be returning to this a little later in the week. No, I, 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 I
talking about it. Jim, oh, let me say something. No, I, I, I talking about it. Jim, oh, let me say something. Well, it really is very, very hard to remember an interview that got so much attention even before it was broadcast. And then when it was broadcast, millions of you watched. I even thought about getting up right in the middle of the night to watch it. Didn't do that, but the moment I woke up, I immediately turned on to find out what Lance Armstrong had said. And so many of you have been talking about the details of what he had to say and, of course, the rights and wrongs of what he's did. And though it's a very long interview, in fact, we'll get the second half of it later on today, it really all boiled down to this. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. In all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. No room for confusion there. Let's bring in Michael, who's live from London. Amanda's in Johannesburg and Hans is in Cleveland, Ohio. All of you, you're very welcome here on the program. Michael, let me start with you, but all three of you feel free to join in. Michael, has this changed your view of Lance Armstrong? Um, no, not at all. I think it's exactly what I expected. I mean, I've been avidly following. I was, I was suspicious from quite a few years ago, and then the more you read, I mean... I read the USADA report and I read the Tyler Hamilton book in depth and it's, um, I suppose, to actually see him uh, admit it on video is a little bit of a shock if you follow for two years, just to actually see it uh, visually um, that he actually came out and said it. But apart from that, um, it was actually probably a little bit of a, a, a disappointment because it was inevitable that it was... Um, it was almost like a, a, a bit of a PR spin um, on how he actually came out in the end. So you, were, so, you, so you weren't surprised. Amanda, what about you? Um, I wasn't surprised. I mean, obviously, I thought he had done it the right way, but he confessed and... Mm. Um, you know, there's nothing else that can be said. Does it change your view um, of it? All we have to do is just accept it. Do you still like him as a sportsman? No, not at all. No. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, back, in, back then, everyone was doping. Um, I think it's 20 out of 21 of the top mm. 10 finishers or something between 96 and 2000 were doping. Well, I should jump in, Amanda, and so say, of course, to the, top guy, the top guys were doping. They were the ones who were winning. There were lots of other professional cyclists who weren't. They just weren't performing so well. Hans, let's bring you in. And we've been toing and froing on email about this, but tell me, have you changed your view now that you've seen what he has to say? Uh, no, no, my view hasn't changed. The thing I'm disappointed in, though, is the fact that he did take legal action against the people who accused him of doping. And um, if I were to say the one thing that I feel is the biggest wrong in all of this, it would be that. Thank you very much indeed, Hans. Thanks to Michael as well. Amanda, just before we wrap up, um, why are you worshipping, why are you looking up to a man who cheated the world? Yes, he cheated the world, but I think his integrity has, has won out in the end because he did confess. You know, obviously he's a fool now because he's mm -hmm. confessed to having, you know, lied to the public and sued people for telling the truth. And mm -hmm. I think it's honourable that he's, you know, owned up and said, listen, I'm sorry, Please forgive me, and I think we should. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. You're using the words integrity and honour, two that I haven't heard a great deal in the same sentence as Lance Armstrong in the last few hours. Thanks to all three of our guests for coming on and talking about Lance. You can carry on uh, the conversation using the hashtag WHYS. I'll speak to you soon.